In New York City yesterday, surveillance video captured a police officer shooting a suspect who had just attacked another officer with a claw hammer. The entire incident begins and ends in mere seconds. It was just the latest in a series of police shootings caught on camera. And while some of these shootings may appear to be justified, many others do not. They've helped drive the rise of a protest movement against overaggressive policing, particularly against young black men. But while protesters see bias and in many cases malice, police often tell a different story. They say the public does not understand how difficult it is to make those split second life or death decisions when anyone you encounter might be armed. I wanted to get a better sense of their perspective, so I set out to approximate that experience for myself. Has he got a license, please? Get out of the car! Get out of the car! It looked like a routine traffic stop until LeVar Jones reached for his wallet. South Carolina Highway Patrol Trooper Sean Grubert said he thought Jones was going for a gun. Why did you shoot me? Jones survived and Grubert was fired and arrested, now faces up to 20 years in prison. It was just one of a spate of horrifying police shootings caught on camera. Move back! Move back! wanted to find out how police train for such situations. So he we went to the Morris County Public Safety Training Academy in New Jersey, where police recruits first learn how to make split second decisions, not in the streets, but here inside a 300 degree virtual reality simulator designed to teach officers when they should and shouldn't use deadly force. Sergeant Paul Carifi Jr. runs the training. It's a decision making process, whether they're gonna use Verbal commands escalate to maybe pepper spray, hands-on, or move on to deadly force. The simulator is interactive, with Karifi at the controls deciding what the actors will do and say based on how the trainee responds. The actors will respond to your commands. So depending on how that goes, it could start off at a very high intense scenario, but based on you being able to de-escalate it, through verbal commands, conversation, it now comes down and the problem's resolved. All right. I was outfitted with a real gun, modified to shoot a laser, as well as a can of pepper spray that mimics a real thing, and an impulse device clipped to my belt, which would give me an electric shock to indicate that I've been shot. Most scenarios begin with information from police dispatch. My first call is about a man illegally dumping debris from his truck. Okay, can you can you drop that please for me? That concrete block? You put uh, that You want me to put the block down? Yes, sir. Put the block down. Huh? Yeah, I'll put the block down. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> oh, easy. All right, all right. Afterward, Sergeant Karifi reviewed my decisions. Okay. Now, you drew your weapon here. I probably shouldn't have. Okay, right. <laughs> because even if he attempts to throw that block right, at you, right. how far can he throw right, that block? Right, are you right, able right. to right. step back? Step out, right. Okay. Yeah. Also, what are some of the other options you have on you? Pepper spray. Yeah. Pepper that. spray. Yeah. So would you be, this guy is going to attempt to throw this block at you. Yeah. Could you have pepper sprayed him? Yeah, right. Yes, yeah, right, so you could have used right, that. Right. My next call. Dispatch says a male subject is yelling at a female in a vacant lot. You your ass all strung out. Turn around. Hold on a second. Hey, man, everything's cool. Don't even worry about it. I got this. I'll take care of it. Thank you. Hold on a second. Can you please tell me your name, ma'am? Hey, man, I said don't worry about it. I've got it. She's with me. I'm going to take care of it. Uh, take off. Thank you. Hold on one second. Take a step back right now. I'm going to need you to take a step back. Ma'am, can you tell me your name? Do you need any medical Look, assistance? Hannah, I'm taking her home. I cop? Ain't supposed to be fighting crime? Ain't no crime here. Take off. Thank you. Okay, I hear what you're saying. Step back. Ma'am, I'm going to ask you if you need any medical assistance. Oh, like At this point, the man runs away, leaving me with the woman. Would you come near me? Okay. Leave me the f alone. I'll stab you in the f throat. Okay, okay, calm down. All right, are you okay? I'm going to ask you to put that needle down, please. Put the needle down. Put, thank you very much. Do you feel that this would be a deadly force, that this would warrant deadly force? No. No, it would not. No. 
it's only a little needle. Yeah. You know, yes, if you were stabbed by it, depending on what, you know, it could be on that needle, but could you get away? You know what's have also- your pepper spray, you have many other options. You know what's also interesting is the way that you perceive threat between a man and a woman. Like that dude, that just seemed more threatening, a guy with a big cinder block, even though frankly, like that it wasn't that wasn't that much more threatening than her there with a needle. Right. But it felt all it seemed a lot and more threatening. One of the things that when we train the officers and especially the new recruits is a woman can hurt you just as right. much as a man can. Right. I ran through a number of additional simulations, usually arriving upon a scene of disorder, with the possibility of violence always lurking. Whoa! Jesus Christ! <laughs> the training conditions you to remember that anyone might have a firearm, and they may take it out at any time and try to kill you. We have a restraining order against her, so get that crazy bitch out of here. Okay, okay, I'm gonna need you to stand back there. Whoa, Jesus! Drop the weapon. Stand back. I want you to get up, get up, get up, and stand. In the vast majority of real situations, of course, the suspect does not pull out a gun. I asked Karifi how he could train recruits for the worst without creating a police force that is too ready to shoot first. We instill in them that, listen, you need to train for these things should they happen, but the majority of the time, it's not going to happen. I'll bet you that if the media, if these people reporting on this, were to actually go through that training, they would have a whole different perspective on what a police officer has to go through and that split second timing that they have to make that life or death situation, that decision. I did just that. I definitely came away with an appreciation for how hard the job is, but also an appreciation for just how easy and how dangerous it is to come to see everyone you encounter as your enemy. With me now, three former police officers, all of whom served on the streets of New York City. Steve Osborne, former commanding officer of the Manhattan Gang Squad and author of The Job, True Tales from the Life of New York City Cop. Dr. Robert Gonzalez, 20-year veteran, former NYPD assistant commissioner for training, responsible for putting in place new training programs for the largest police force in the country. And Eric Sanders, retired NYPD officer, member of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, now an attorney representing clients in civil rights and criminal cases. We're going to talk about police training, a whole lot more about life as a cop. That's ahead. Stick around. All right, we're back with three NYPD veterans, former Manhattan Gang Squad Commander Steve Osborne, retired NYPD officer and attorney Eric Sanders, and Dr. Robert Gonzalez, who developed new training programs for NYPD recruits. Um, all right, so first we'll just talk about this training. Uh, there's only about 55 of these in the country, I think. Did, did you guys go through this? That didn't exist when you were training, I imagine. Right. No. We, no. <laughs> We actually did, actually, in the NYPD, um, do the research on, on the particular advice that you actually went through, which is the 300-degree system. Um, it's a phenomenal system. It's actually real to life. Uh, it puts you in a real-life scenario, adrenaline, you know, and, and it, sees, it tests your judgment and your reaction to certain type of scenarios and situations. The NYPD currently has a couple of these devices that they purchase, and they actually use them and they bring them out to community meetings so that the community can actually participate in some of these type of scenarios to get a feel of what it's like to That's be a police officer and make these judgment-based decisions. So it's a phenomenal piece of equipment. So one of, here's, before we get to force, before we even get to that, here's one of the things that struck me is I think we watch, we watch cop shows, police procedurals, and it's about crime. You know, it's a, it's a, there's, a, there's been a murder, and then they show up, and then they get, you know, they have the tweezers with the bullets. And right. The, you know, the, right. All, we all know that, right? <laughs> and so you think, well, that's what being... But, you know, from the training and also from police officers I've interviewed, a huge amount of being a cop, particularly beat cop, is you just show up in scenes of disorder. Two guys tried to go for the same parking place. They crash into each other. And X has showed up at the house, and the current... Uh, you know, love interest is there and they're screaming at each other. That was one of the scenarios. And what struck me when I walked on them is I have zero equipment to deal with this. Like, there's nothing illegal happening here necessarily. It's two people screaming at each other. So I don't know, stop yelling at each other. Like, well, how do you, how do you train but for you that? But you do have equipment. You know the most important piece of equipment a police officer has? Their brain. Yeah. That's the most important mm. piece of equipment a police officer can ever have. To be able to use their logic to think through problems. Right. There's an old saying that in police work, uh, a cop's mouth is his greatest weapon. Yeah. To be able to go into a chaotic situation where everybody's yelling and screaming, there's, sometimes there's alcohol, there's drugs involved, and be able to talk everybody down. 
when you see a real experienced cop do that, it's right. a magical thing. Right. right, but then the question is, how do you train to produce that magic reliability? Because it, it occurred to me, if I was 25 years old with a gun, <laughs> showing up with two people screaming at each other, I don't, I literally don't know. I mean, I consider myself like a pretty smooth talker, talk for a living, right? right. I don't know. I don't know, you know, so, so from a training perspective, it's like, how do you create the training conditions to actually produce the skills in people to do that before you're even, anyone's doing anything with any sort of weapon? Right. Well, the key was what you just said, which was skill. Being a police officer is, in fact, a skill. We take six months of academic education followed by some sort of hands-on experience that we get from hopefully from a veteran officer. And these, these skills that you get as far as de-escalation, about how to communicate, um, you know, using voice tones and things of that nature are all things that come with time, they come with seniority, and they come with skill. It's not something you, you have when you get right out of the police academy, it's something you develop. But let me ask you this, the New York Times ran this piece and they said this, is, this was the, the typical cadet training. How to use a gun, 58 hours. Defensive tactics, 49 hours. How to calm situations without force, eight hours. Right. Is that the right balance? Uh, more or less. I mean, there, uh, there is a certain standard as per, depending on what state and what jurisdiction. Right. No, there but I mean, not, not is that the correct balance. Right. Is that the right balance? Like, should those numbers be what they are? Well, you only have a certain amount of hours to educate a police officer within six months. And you have to prioritize what's important. Uh, and again, the real training, the real hands-on experience takes place after they graduate. So you have, to, you have to formulate some sort of academic curriculum. And based on those hours that you gave or that analysis you just gave, that's probably accurate. Well, but the real skills training, the hands-on on experience really doesn't take place till after you hit the street. Well, I said from the beginning, and my philosophy is again, the part of the problem is, and the show is going to be a little too short for this, but it's how you screen the people in. That's part of what the mm. major problem mm. is, is mm. who you're bringing into the police part. Police work is not for every person. And I think that's part of what the major component is. I don't think the training is necessarily a problem. Huh. I think it's that we're it's getting screening the wrong people. what kind of person that's, is going to respond to those. Have you seen it in okay. different Okay, but shooters. here's the other thing I got to ask. Mm -hmm. Let's say I go in, I'm a cheerful guy, I'm an optimist, I love people, okay? <laughs> that will change quickly. Right, that's my, no, but this is a serious point. This is a serious point. Mm -hmm. And then every day, all day long, I just see people at their worst. All day long, screaming. Domestic violence, someone beating up uh, the person that he is uh, married to. Uh, people in the depths of addiction, grips of addiction. Mm -hmm. People being violent, duplicitous, and all, that's all I see, all day. Like, how do you not start to think people are terrible and expect terrible things from people every time you encounter them? One of the benefits of, of being a cop is we get a lot of vacation time. And the reason that you get it is some days you just got to get away from it. You know, it, 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 things have been busy day after day, month after month, and sometimes you just got to... I'm taking a week off. Kinda I need detox. to get away. You got to kind of detox from, you know, like he said, the vigorous daily routine of dealing with people at their worst. Unfortunately, that's the downside to mm -hmm. policing. You, you get called to a scene when things are not good. But here's well, the... But there's wait. another component yeah. that no one thinks about. Police officers, you know, especially in New York and other places, they used to interact with lots of people in the street. That's not necessarily a problem. You know what really burdens police officers? What goes on internally. That's what burdens more than more than anything else. As far as quotas, times, things you have to do, that's a bigger burden to the police officer than ever. You, you're saying the organizational the politics right. of oh, being organizational a cop. Politics. Being, oh, yeah. Most police reg resignations are not a result of dealing with the community. They're a result of, like he said, what's happening in the precinct in the station house. Right. All right. You know, things of that nature. So now, now let's talk about use of force. Right. Um, one thing that occurred to me was, another thing occurred to me is, that training would be very different in Belgium or Japan or a country where no one has guns. Right. I mean, a huge part of the way that I you, you are trained to think about it is just, yeah, anyone could have a gun. Right? I mean, wouldn't, is that true, do you think? Over the years, like, uh, as a cop and as a supervisor, I was involved in literally thousands of arrests. And everything goes smooth, it goes smooth, it goes smooth. And then for me, it was always when I least expected it. And I had little or no warning. You go to ring the guy's doorbell, he was some Wall Street guy. I went to go lock him up. He answers the door with a gun and a vest on. You know, stop two guys in the street just to question him. Guy pulls out a gun on me, and next thing I know, I'm in a fight for my life. So you always have to be prepared. Right, right. but here's the question. And this, is, this was the thing I wanted to see in this training. Yep. How do you strike the right balance? Because you don't want to, tr you don't need to train officers to focus on that moment that's going to be the worst, most dangerous moment. Right. But what you don't want to do is create a false impression of how common that's going to be, such that they have this 
aggressive expectation that we saw played out with that South Carolina State trooper where right. a guy goes for his wallet. Right. How do you do it? Well, we set up scenario-based training where we put officers in scenarios and then we critique, you know, their actions, similar to what you did. But we do it more, some, we have what's called the fun house or the tack house, right. where they bring you into this tactical village and you go and they, and they assess, you know, how you handle particular situations. And the first thing we assess when we look at those types of incidents is, is that you don't run into it overzealous. Right. If you remember from your scenario, you actually had your gun out when you didn't even need it. No, you're so, right, yes. That yes. was, yes. So, so we want to make sure that when we do training that we actually have scenarios that you don't have to use force. But are, are, you know? but so are police doing that well enough? Are they striking that balance well enough right now? Like what was said earlier, I mean, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of contacts that we as officers have with the public on a regular basis, and they just become routine. And the public doesn't scrutinize the routine incidents. What they do is they critique those high-profile cases when police officers may do something that could be borderline. And it makes it seem like that's all we do but, is borderline contacts. Yeah, but the yeah. NYPD handles about 4.5 million 911 calls for service a year. 80,000 involve weapons. Right. You don't hear about any of that. Right. You right. just hear about it. 80,000 million goes people wrong. have weapons. 80, right. Th four right. and a half million calls for service right. and 80,000 of them. But there's a reason. I mean, there's a reason we hear about when something goes wrong, right? Because right. it's a big deal mm -hmm. when a police officer shoots someone. Right. You know, it's right. a big, yeah. it's well, a big deal when a police officer is shot. I mean, that's, yeah. but we, the, these are the people that we entrust to protect us. And, right. and in a case where, you know, there's been a few cases recently, a, a mom calls and her schizophrenic son is, is having a, 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 an episode right. and he ends up dead, you right. know, that's the worst possible outcome, right? right. right. Oh, and yeah. that's gonna make someone think twice about calling the cops. Right, oh, that's true. Right. That's absolutely correct. Um, could we talk about bias for a second? Yeah. Okay. We know as a matter of social science, people have implicit bias. Right. In fact, this is, this, there's actually a, 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 you know, there's been experiments on a shooting game, right? Oh, Where yeah. you, you have to decide if someone's got a grocery bag or a gun. Right. And, you know, it shows in video simulations people are more likely to shoot black suspects yes. than they are white, even if the black yes. suspect um, do, is unarmed, right? Yes. We, we know this. This is an established thing. Right. The police training we talked to didn't seem to have an active module to attack that. Right. Do, does the NYPD and our police departments doing enough to attack a thing that is pre-conscious? It's right. not, yes. right? Well, I mean, right now, especially just, just nationally, we're trying to diversify our agencies, make our agencies more reflective of the communities that we serve so that the officers that come in know that, you know, they're, they're born with a certain <laughs> culture and hopefully they're going to behave and have Why that sensitivity laughing? with now, their culture. I know Rob a long time. That was a political <laughs> answer. You know, they're not doing enough. And this is what goes back to the screening process. We know there's confirmation bias. We also know there's been studies going way back in 2000, 2002, famous studies done on this that said no police officers do engage in a sort of bias. The problem is the screening process to get in don't deal with bias. But here's the thing, neither, the neither, screening, neither screening nor diversity solves the problem because Doesn't, the thing we know from the research is that everybody has it, even African Americans, Latinos, right? Yes. Have anti-black bias, anti-people of color bias in those simulations. Yes. Right. Experience and maturity. Right. That's the answer. You know, over the years, I mean, I've had a very rich white guy pull a gun and try and shoot me, a homeless black guy pull a gun and try and shoot me. When I look at somebody, I, I, I treat everybody evenly. Uh, unfortunately, after all of those incidents, you tend to look at everybody as a threat sometimes. <laughs> equality, equality is achieved by complete unanimous skepticism. Survival. Retired, That's what's called survival <laughs> in the street. Former Manhattan Gang Squad Commander Steve Osborne, retired NYPD officer and attorney Eric Sanders, and Dr. Robert Gonzalez, who developed training programs for NYPD recruits. Thank you all. Really uh, learned a lot from that. A reminder, all three of our guests here tonight will be answering any questions you might still have. Just go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash onwithchris, to post your questions.